My pleasure to have in studio today the Frisbee family head coach, Harvard men's lacrosse program, Jerry Byrne, the 18th coach in school history. Jerry, thanks so much for coming in the studio and joining us today. Thank you, Jack. Look, look where we've gone. We've known each other forever, and now we're in a beautiful studio here in Milton, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's really a, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, just, uh, I mean, I could talk to you for hours because you've got such uh, great knowledge of the game, not only as a player, as a coach, and even from the marketing uh, days at Bryan and your retail days up in New Hampshire. But I just wanted to mention a couple of things that people might not know uh, about Jerry Byrne, uh, native of Levittown. Um, you graduated uh, UMass in 1986, cum laude. Um, tried out for the world team in 89, 87, 2001. Uh, drafted by the New York Saints in 91, and you won a world championship with the Rochester Nighthawks in 1997. You were inducted into to the New England Lacrosse Hall of Fame in 1999 alongside Jack Piatelli. That was a special <laughs> night. Um, you adopted two boys, Pierre and uh, Brandon. Pierre had a great career at Notre Dame. Daughter Rory, member of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish Lacrosse team as well. Um, your wife, Dr. Tracy Sweats Byrne, graduated from Notre Dame. What happened to you? Three Notre, three Notre Dame uh, grads. <laughs> you ended up at UMass. Uh, yeah, I went to grad school there. That kind of counts. Uh, we'll, we'll give you credit for that. And um, your brother uh, Stephen played at Virginia. Uh, you spent some time at Bryan as the director of marketing, um, and you also were the head coach at St. Anselm's in 2005. Uh, lastly, uh, one of your uh, teammates, and uh, he says you were his roommate, but I don't think you were his roommate, uh, That uh, is the head coach at Longmeadow High School, Keith Campbell. No doubt. <laughs> Man, you, you've checked all the necessary boxes in the Jerry Byrne Wikipedia file there ending with uh keith campbell who's a great mutual friend of ours we we've roomed together at uh, alumni get togethers we're we're uh, can jam teammates we're tennis teammates future pickleball teammates keith and i are cut from the same cloth ruthlessly competitive but hopefully guys you want to hang out with in the bar too yeah uh, yeah he's dangerous when you get to the bar though that's for <laughs> sure um, your, you know, your player resume speaks for itself. Uh, you are a great player. You continue to play. Uh, you've kept yourself in tremendous shape. You spent 16 years at Notre Dame. You were named assistant, uh, assistant coach of the year in 2011. You might, was it more than just a one-time? That, that's a one-time thing. Well, that's a one, that was a one-time deal. Um, and, uh, the other thing is, uh, you're obviously you're been a great parent a great husband uh but it must have been very special for you to be able to coach your son and watch your daughter play at notre dame yeah no doubt i think that you know it's it's one of the reasons why i stayed at notre dame for so long was to have that ability to watch my uh, two of my three children you know matriculate into into notre dame and so um yeah no that's that's a special thing, you know. Fortunate for him, he didn't coach the position, play the position that I coached, so he didn't he didn't earn my wrath uh, too often um, uh, from a defensive standpoint. But uh, you know, having two of your kids go to the school that you're a graduate of and my wife is a graduate of is, you know, there's not too many better things than that. Now, obviously, you played a long time and continue to play while you're at Notre Dame, 16 seasons as an assistant coach. Um, total of 16 years, took a little break there, but um, did you always know you wanted to get into coaching? Um, and why did you get into coaching? No, I, you know, I, I was saying this to somebody recently that I never foresaw that as my career. And then, you know, for your listeners, I think a lot of people think they have their life planned out. They think it's going to be this linear trajectory that, you know, you're at point A and you're going to get to point Z and, and then you retire is that, you know, life intercedes and and changes happen that you don't always see coming. So my first stint at coaching at Notre Dame was from 1989 to 1991. And that was, you know, that was so I could get my master's degree in business. I loved the coaching piece and it, it helped me afford to do that. And when I left, I was in the, you know, corporate world for the next 15 years in different management and marketing and, and sports management, sports marketing roles. And um, I had a great position. 
um, at that time, right, right at this moment that things were going well for me professionally. Um, the company that I worked for was going through some real financial challenges. I was the CMO of, of, of a, a company in um, Medway, Mass, and I lost my job. And it was a public company, and I lost my job, but I got a, a one-year severance package, so I didn't have to work for a year. And right at that moment, my wife and I adopted two uh, African-American boys. And next thing you know, your life is completely different. You, you know, you're, you're focused on your kids. You're always focused on your kids. But I also had now had the freedom to figure out what my next step was going to be. I thought for sure I'd stay in, in, in the management and marketing field. But I also volunteered to coach the high school team in Amherst, New Hampshire, Sauhegan High School. They needed a coach. Their previous coach had been fired for basically sanctioning locker boxing tournaments. And so I came in, I looked like the sensitive guy coming in oh, to that situation. And so that was really how I got back into coaching. I didn't have to work for a year and I wanted to give back to the town that we were living in at that time. And that led to kind of reconnecting. I was playing in the MLL at the time. I was one of the older players playing in the MLL when the MLL started uh, in 2001. So staying, being 39 years old, still playing, adopting two kids, not having a job was a great way to kind of, out of necessity, to assess, all right, what am I doing with my life now? I started coaching. I loved it. And I never went back and got a regular job and because how, I stayed in coaching. Now, how did you end up back at Notre Dame? Um, so I was at Sauhegan High School, and then I left to coach at St. A's, at St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire, which I love too, another kind of program that had hey, quick shout out to St. A's, making the... NCAA tournament for the first time. That was definitely one of my dreams when I started coaching there. So it's great to see the co current coaching staff having that success. Mike Shimada. Uh, Mike Shimada, go Hawks. Is that um, I was at St. A's and we were living in Peterborough Temple, New Hampshire. And um, in my wife's dream house, the 1774 farmhouse that we were renovating. And uh, the uh, Kevin Anderson, who was the head assistant at Notre Dame, was leaving coaching. And I happened to be working a camp at Notre Dame when that announcement came out. And I was like, man, this is, this could be uh, fortuitous. And I talked to my wife and, you know, it's what my wife and I met at Notre Dame when I was in grad school, when she was an undergrad. And, you know, we had some unbelievable memories and we turned on to be there for another 13 years. We went back from, you know, 2006 to, to 2019. And so it was just timing. And as I was saying before, your life isn't a straight path, and it's not a straight path if you're a high school aspiring student athlete trying to figure out where you're going to play in college or if you can play in college or even where you're going to go to college. You don't have to have your life figured out. So I, I thought for sure I'd go back to the corporate world, but I never went back, and uh, I ended up staying at Notre Dame for, for 13 years. As you said, coached my own kids at one of the great places on the planet, and now I feel like being at Harvard, I'm at the great pl greatest place on the planet. Now – 16 years as an assistant coach, obviously you had great success as the defensive coordinator. Team had great success, a number of you know NCAA Final Fours, made it to a championship game. Uh, while you were there, did you always think about or wanting to be a, a head coach? Was that your plan going forward? You know, I, th I think my plan was, you know, at some point I'd be the head coach at Notre Dame. And I think uh, there was an element of that, of truth, in that particularly, you know, working with Kevin for so long, you know, I'm, I'm the godfather for his oldest child, Will, who's now my assistant at Harvard. Talk about the small world of, of lacrosse. So I think that was kind of the plan and the vision, and it just the timing just didn't work out. And, and there had been some other opportunities uh, prior to that, but I think I got to the point where um, it was less about impatience and more about what's the next journey and excitement and adventure in my life for my, for my wife and I, my wife is an unbelievably gifted and talented uh, physician and surgeon. And, you know, she's the true rock star of, of the relationship. And, you know, the combination of us building our life in South Bend made it hard to leave. And then, you know, your kids are, are rooted there. Their life is embedded there. They became, you know, students at Notre Dame, student athletes at Notre Dame. And so a lot of things kind of were the, the timing and all the tumblers never fell in place to leave. 
for for a head coaching opportunity. So the combination of my kids finally graduating with an opportunity at Harvard, I think that combined with Boston being a great city, this real hope at Harvard that Harvard could become a top 10 program and real support from the university. I think all those things finally came together. And being in my mid-50s at that time, I just felt like if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. And so I, I went into it with both feet, you know, head first and, and went after it. And we have been doing that for the last year and a half um, and still waiting for my wife to move. So, honey, if you're listening, uh, can't wait to see you. <laughs> I was going to ask you that question because I know you had a number of opportunities to coach at the Division One level as a head coach. Why Harvard? You know, I think part of it was the timing. Part of it was, you know, my family's always been super supportive of, you know, those aspirations. Um, it just didn't, you know, the timing was never ideal. And the reality is in life is that the timing doesn't always work out. And so you have to have an element of, of, of faith. You know, my relationship with the guys that I recruited at Notre Dame was, was super deep. You know, I've been to I've been to christenings and weddings and unfortunately funerals and a variety of things. So I felt I felt deeply rooted there. Um, so that was really hard. My, my, the the success that my wife was having professionally, I didn't want to uproot that because she had worked you know even harder than I am in establishing that credibility and those relationships and that and her practice in in South Bend. And so you know I think why Harvard, you know, was a combination of all of those things coming together, better timing. And then in some ways, the fact that of all the schools that I had some opportunities to look at as a head coaching position, Harvard was the furthest one from being fully formed or being close to being a, a, an NCAA tournament team or an Ivy League championship team. So in some weird way, I like that challenge being even more difficult you know, climbing up that hill. And we've all been, you know, whether it's, you know, you're a high school player trying to go from JV to varsity or whether you're somebody who's trying to, you know, a coach or someone running a business, you're trying to take your 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 organization to another level. There is nothing better than that. I, I find that really inspiring and really interesting. And so Harvard had a long way to go and I was up for that challenge and you know, the, the people I met in the process, the players, uh, the administration were super supportive uh, and a belief that Harvard should be in the top of the Ivy League. And if you're in the top of the Ivy League, you're one of the 10 or 15 best teams in the country. So what they were looking for was what I was about. And I love the challenge. Congratulations. So we're going to switch gears. I've been a big fan of yours. When you were at Notre Dame, you started your YouTube station uh, XL 360, uh, you've got some great teaching moments, uh, I w and you've continued at Harvard. I pass that information along to my coaches, my players. Um, really great educational information for not only me, but our families, our coaches. And uh, I've got a clip here I want you to listen to, and I have some questions about it. So when you're teaching your guys, as the ball gets thrown on the perimeter, having a sense of whether you slid or not, how much trust you give to your defender, where's the more threatening guy? A guy who's outside the hash at 10 or a guy who's cutting straight down Hempstead Turnpike? So the only way you develop that awareness is every time the ball moves, you turn and orient yourself to your man and your role differently. If you just stay focused on your man, You'll never be in a role that can help your defense. Great point. So many defenders don't understand that if they just focus on their man, not only are they giving the other team an opportunity for more space and time and move the ball, good shot, but they're hurting their teammates, their defenders they're working with. You know, I think the, you know, starting on your first point, I think I, I feel an obligation as a member of the lacrosse community to, to give. You know, there's been so much that's been given to us and that, you know, paying it forward in that way is really a lot of the motivation for, um, you know, the YouTube channel that I built at Notre Dame, uh, along with Kevin Dugan, shout out to Kay Dugan. And uh, the one that we've built with, with my assistants at, at Harvard is, 
that you're trying to raise the level of play and you're trying to develop relationships with young coaches or coaches at high school and youth and middle school and things like that. So our, our motivation is to humanize our program, but also to, to give back. Uh, relative to the clip that you played, you know, I think coaching defense is, is, is hard. Not hard like intellectually or hard to do physically, but there's so much focus on covering people, which is obviously crazy important ball pressure. The ability to guard the ball carriers is always going to be important. But it's hard to teach off-ball defense. It's hard to teach sliding. It's hard to teach supporting off-ball, mostly because they're – in a good way, there's a lot of ego combined with, like, I don't want my man to score. And so what I've tried to do over the last 15 years is is shift that narrative around this group. You either get the stop or you do not. Nobody cares whether you stripped a guy and then he picked it up. No one cares that you had a ground ball and then it got checked out of bounds, that, so you got one ground ball for your stat line, that it's completely binary, that you either stopped your opponent from scoring and then cleared the ball, or you didn't. And so if you kind of take more of like a, almost like a socialist approach to defense, which is we need to work together to get this outcome. And so that's how I've always felt about it. I don't like, I don't care who guards people. I don't do that in scouting reports. We don't say, hey, Jack Piatelli, you're covering Joe Blow. Joe Blow is really good. Like, no, we're, our team is trying to stop their team. And so as a result, I, I, my, my belief on defense is, is, you know, orientation and stance and communication and off-ball awareness and approaches and exits when you're leaving a role or a man, all of that stuff is, goes into a calculus that leads to, it doesn't guarantee you stops, but what it does is it guarantees that the offense has a miserable experience trying to get a really good shot. Now, do you find the players coming to play for you on the defensive side of the field understand most of that, or is you have to teach a lot of that? No, I think you you always have to teach, you know, because you got guys coming from different backgrounds and different methodologies and different philosophies, different geographies, you know, you know, great teams in a bad geography or a pretty good team in you know a, an established area like Baltimore or Philadelphia or Long Island is so you get a whole spectrum sure and but that is why one of the added benefits of having a YouTube channel where you're you're putting out who you are and what you believe in so regularly is that they can start drinking from that Kool-Aid sure uh, earlier I don't we, we don't intercede in their development as players but if they're paying attention they know what we're about and whether it's doing podcasts like this or doing webinars on our uh, HLX 360 YouTube channel, you can find out what we're about as a program, and you can definitely find out what I'm about and what I believe in defensively. And I tell our recruits, I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what to watch, but if you really want to be prepared, you should d dig deep because it's not that complex, but it's consistent. And today there are no secrets, you know, amongst yep. teams. So what you do is what you do, and you're, it's it's nice you're able to share it, right? Because you know you gotta you gotta play against it whether you know it or not, and it's in, and it's the X's and O's and the execution. So um, again, we've got another clip I want you to listen to. Okay. When you're watching film with your team, and I think hopefully one of the benefits of the series that we're doing is trying to teach your guys how to watch film on their own. And I'm a big believer in kind of empowering your players to not only coach themselves, but, but um, you know, coaching teammates. I emphasize to our players, uh, my own kids, film, watch games. And it was just refreshing to hear you say it's a motivation, but not only to make yourself better, make your teammates better, and how important it is for the players, the listeners out there, to watch film and go to games and watch the games live. You know, I think that clip, like, hits on a couple of different things. One is, you know, our generation, because you and I are, are the same age, is that, you know, we had way, way much more free play. Like, we went out on the street or we went into the local lot or the local field, yeah. and we just 
made up games and and learned how to compete and learn how to compete against each other. And not that that doesn't happen anymore, but it's harder because life is much more structured. You got play days and travel teams and, hey, we want you to do this a hundred times and things like that, is that you have this real cultural divide between coaches of our age and, and this age group. But instead of complaining about that, I feel like fostering some of the best things about how we learned how to play sport um, in, in today's modern times with the technology that they have is, is, is super important. It's also a crazy valuable cultural tool. This generation, not to malign them, isn't as bluntly honest with each other the way the previous generation was, where if you had a problem with a guy when we were growing up, you didn't triangulate it. You went right at the guy and you, maybe you agreed to disagree or maybe you threw down and you were rolling around yeah. and, and fighting and, and resolved it right after that is creating these mechanisms where they are forced to be critical of a teammate, not always critical. It could be like complimentary on one thing, but hey, you did that really well, but you need to get better at that because that is the game. Once the game starts, the coaching staff is 30, 40 yards away from the action a lot. In the game, you need to be able to deliver harsh truths to your teammate, and he needs to be able to accept that and not getting distracted by who the messenger was. You know what? I don't like Jimmy. Well, nobody cares in the game whether you like Jimmy because you either got to stop or you didn't. Right. Coming back to that, right. coming back to that point. So, culturally, it's a crazy important tool to develop your team in this candor because it's the same candor you want on the field is the same candor you want on Saturday night if Johnny, you know, maybe had one too many beers, and you're like Johnny, you need to go home. And Johnny needs to accept that message and, and disassociate it from the messenger. So the film element of that, that clip is I also want to empower my guys to develop when they're not around me. If it's all about like I'm Moses coming down from the mountaintop with the, with the commandments, then they're not going to do anything on their own. They're just going to wait for the wisdom to flow out of me and my assistant coaches. And that's not going to be enough that you have to create an environment where they're so energized and so inspired that they want to do things when you're not even around. And part of that is, is empowering maybe your upperclassmen. And part of that is giving them the tools and the resources and stepping back and, and letting them know that, you know what, if, if my best defenseman at Harvard is running a film session, I know it's not the same way that I would do it, but I, I'm willing to give up some of that power so he can develop his leadership because nothing teaches like having to teach someone else how to play a game or make a play or make a decision and things like that. So all of those things come together for me in a really powerful way when it comes to peer-to-peer -to -peer development. A coach's willingness to say, hey, Jimmy, I want you to run this drill, and then you walk away. There's, there's, there's great long-term benefit, great cultural benefit, great leadership benefit, and, and you'll find out who the guys on your team that are open to that and willing to kind of take the reins there. And a great life experience. And to, to your point it, uh, about the film, it's uh, not only doing what you have to do, but understanding why you're doing it. Exactly. So you were in the corporate world for three or four years, five years? No, fifth, yeah. no corporate? Corporate world, 10, 15 10, years. 10, 15 years. Uh, what experiences uh, working in that corporate crazy world did you bring into your coaching style? You know, I think, like, even before I get that, I, I felt like, you know, Chaminade was a really important formative thing for me. It's, it's, a, it's a unapologetically competitive place where, you know, like, 75 is failing. So if you get a 74, you're gone. You, and, and you don't get to go to summer school. You don't get to, you know, come back and take the test again. And your parents don't come in and say, hey, you know, little Gerard is, you know, really a good student. He just had a bad day. No, you get a 74, you're done. And so the kind of the ruthlessness and the cold, hard, competitive nature of that place. And it was not a place that, you know, uh, socioeconomically I fit in come, being the son of a fireman is 
So I kind of came in with a little bit of a chip, like I'm going to prove that I deserve to be here, and I know my parents are sacrificing. So like learning a work ethic and a pride around a performance, being prepared each day, and delivering, standing and delivering when asked a question, that was super formative uh, to me. And then, not that everything else was easy after that, but I, like having that foundation was crazy. That was the most important four years of my life. So when I when I got into the into the corporate world, I started in undergrad in finance, and I you know it happened to be right around the you know eighty seven uh, Black Tuesday of nineteen eighty seven. So it was super competitive. I just didn't feel, I feel it was, you know, it was dehumanizing. It was, it was abstract. It was numbers. It was cold. There wasn't a lot of human connection. You know, I had the same amount of greed as anybody else did back in the mid eighties, as Gordon Gecko would yeah. tell us <laughs> is that I, um, I just didn't feel it. So when I went back to school, I always felt like I had a much more of like a creative, um, uh, messaging communication organizational part of my brain. So I went back to school for, you know, strategy and, and marketing and brand management background and, and then did that. You know, I think some, you know, like for most of us having some really important mentors and, um, you know, people who helped you understand how to take what you learn from books and case study method, which is how you learn in business school. Ironically, uh, Mendoza uh, School, the business school at Notre Dame uses the Harvard case study method, which is, you know, you're, prevent, you're presented a situation and you figure out how to solve it in your, in your own way, in your own words, with your own logic. And, you know, so how do you take learning from a case study method to the real world? And it was a combination of asking questions, you know, the, the, the pride in, and the work ethic of, of coming from Chaminade and, you know, just, you know, having good people who help help guide you. So, you know, lessons about organization and structure and asking questions and really tearing through logic and, and when in doubt, just work harder. And so I think all of those things kind of came together of what I was able to bring from my corporate world experience to the coaching world. Do you find that you're a better communicator today than you were 15, 20 years ago because of your experience in the corporate world? Yeah, 100%, you know, being forced to talk to big and small groups, summarizing and, and synthesizing your thoughts, you know, taking complex messages or, or problems and distilling it down to its simplest terms so you can figure the most simple way to solve a problem. I think, you know, I, that has, you know, the corporate experience forces you to do that, you know, working for a public company after I left Brian, you know, you're, you're, you got to stand and deliver each day because the stock price doesn't lie. Right. It, you know, and, and, and you, you could be doing all these other things. If it's not, if it's not showing up for Wall Street, then it's almost like it doesn't happen or didn't happen. And so that, that, the pressure of that, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I think I've become addicted to pressure in a good way is that when things are going well, that's when I feel the most stress. I'm, I sometimes manufacture projects and, and pressure just because I'm so used to it, which is not a healthy, people at home, that's not a healthy way of, of attacking um, your problems. But I think speaking and connecting and messaging and positioning are all things I learned after, I learned in business school, but I learned in action in the corporate world when I, when I left there and, um, I use some of those lessons. I, um, I'm a, you know, studying the Harvard case study method in graduate school. I use some, I, I follow them on social media because there's a lot of things that are parallels around culture and introduction of new concepts and introduction of new products. All of those things have parallels to a team that I'm, um, I've only been with for less than two years. Yeah, and you're measured in the corporate world. As a coach, you're measured. I was a sales representative for 30 years, and uh, success is results. And you don't yep. get the results, then you're, you're, you're out of a job. So it's, uh, you can apply those skill sets and those pressures, and you, know, you go, go out and work every single day, because if you don't have results, you know, the next guy is going to come in, and he's going to get results. No doubt. The uh, recruiting process at Harvard, uh, how involved are, are, I know you're very involved because I see you every every tournament that 
our teams are at, you're at, and uh, it's always good to see you. But how involved are your assistant coaches and in terms of the recruiting process at Harvard? How does it, what does it start and how does it end? You know, I love doing that part when I was at, at Notre Dame. But, you know, I think if you're managing any sort of group, and including a, uh, a staff, that you have to recruit elements of yourself that you don't have. So whether it's uh, you know people who are much more savvy technologically, or someone who's maybe more connected in certain geographies or personality gaps and things like that. So I, I was fortunate to to hire a great staff. So Neil Hutchinson, who's my head assistant, I'm you know working with him. He's our he's the you know director of our recruiting. I'm I'm very involved, but I'm also I trust him. And, but I also want to develop him and help him develop, just like I was given that opportunity. You know, Kevin Corrigan at Notre Dame gave me that autonomy, and I wouldn't have become the kind of coach or manager or head coach that I've become without the trust that he gave me. And so it would be hypocritical of me to not to do that with Neil Hutchinson. And I, I've been fortunate because I've been rewarded for that, just like I, I think, rewarded Kevin for the work that I did. Neil has done an unbelievable job as the head of our recruiting in the in the 17 18 months that we've been together at, at Harvard. So it, it is hard to let go the day-to-day -day relationships that you I developed over you know 15 years at at Notre Dame. I miss talking to those guys as much and texting with them as much as I did when I was at at Notre Dame, but I also I trust Neil. And Neil is also supported by Will Corrigan, who's our second assistant, so they work to lead our recruiting efforts. Will is more of the technological expert, so he's organizing and coordinating all the data and all the different software we're using to kind of organize the hundreds of players that are in our system, much like a salesman would manage all of his different accounts. Is So Neil and Will work together. Neil is being, uh, Will is being mentored by Neil, and I'm, I'm mentoring Will as well, but that relationship was very similar to my relationship with Matt Carwick when I was at Notre Dame. Matt's now the head coach at Colgate, and my relationship with Neil, uh, excuse me, with Brian Fisher, who at Notre Dame, who's now the head coach at Monmouth, is that you know that kind of that ecosystem is really important. That no one no one cares about the success. It's all about how well are we doing to evaluate talent and organizing all that data. So. Yeah, I, I miss some of the day-to-day -day stuff, but I'm super involved. You know, when we get to a point where we're agreeing on, hey, we love, you know, Joe Smith, you know, I get super involved and uh, I feel strongly of my ability to communicate with young people and their parents and, and things like that. So they're, they're doing what I did at Notre Dame, which is, you know, you know getting guys ready into the pipeline and, and evaluating them from a skill and admittability and, and passion for Harvard. Once all those things intersect combined with our feeling about that guy's a really good player in person that's when i jump in so is it a unanimous decision on a player or is it your decision on a player no i think but. i think it's a mixture mixture of both ultimately the head coach will make the the final decision but it's great when it's unanimous but you don't always get there um doing this for a long time you have you know i have experiences that they don't have yet and so but so it's important for me to kind of impart those things are right. Why, right? Why am I this non-unanimous decision? Why am I making this this decision? And uh, so, as long as they understand that, but then also, all right, why do I feel this way? Why am I making this decision? Um, conversely, you know, there are opportunities where I don't agree, but they feel like they've learned some things that maybe I haven't been exposed to. So, being open to that, it's not it's not a it's not a monarchy unless it gets to a point where it has to be or could be. What kind of player are you looking for uh, to play for you at Harvard? Is the player very similar to the player you're recruiting at Notre Dame? What characteristics, skill sets? Obviously, academics is, you know, very high standard at Harvard. Um, it's not a very easy school to uh, get admitted to. So, you know, so it's a little bit of different. It's challenging because of the academic piece, but obviously what other characteristics are you looking for in a player? And those characteristics, um, success, how are they successful? You know, I, I think you have to 
you know, the first, before you even get to that, you have to talk about that. Like one of the things that we've done in the last almost two years has been being unbelievably transparent about what Harvard is about, what is unique about it, what's compelling about it, what's, you know, demystifying Harvard in some ways, pulling back the curtain, you know, explaining the mythology around it, making it less intimidating. Because not a lot of people know people who went to Harvard. And so that's been a real kind of mission of ours, like humanizing Harvard. And and I felt like we've done up my Ted Bergman, who runs our social efforts, uh, my assistant, uh, he's also our assistant defensive coordinator, is he's done an unbelievable job. Neil and Will have done an unbelievable job in communicating out to you know, club coaches, high school coaches, assistant coaches, anybody who's an influencer, they've done a great job in telling where what Harvard is about, what's the current state of our program, and more importantly, this is where we're going, and we're looking for people who want to climb on that train. And so that is super important before you get even to the evaluation. There's always a being a, people who have an aspiration to go in Ivy League school. You know, Harvard is, is the top of the food train in that world. So it's not like we can't find people who are interested in Harvard. We need to give them additional reasons. So that's the first part, and I think we've done uh, as good of a job as any team in the country in, in kind of articulating what Harvard and Harvard Lacrosse Program is about. As far as what we're looking for in players, I'm looking for guys whose compete level screams off the film page. If, I, if that doesn't happen, I have a really hard time recruiting guys because to me that's a gateway is that watching a guy play is their physical athletic values personified and so i want to see obviously you want to see guys make plays that everybody recognizes but i'm also hunting for plays that the only person who will recognize it is either our staff or the guy who who coached them so whether it's how they substitute or how they celebrate with their teams, or if they're a midfielder, do they play defense? Are they getting tough ground balls? Because everybody wants to make the play that their girlfriend recognizes. Who doesn't want to score a goal or make the save or strip the guy if you're a defenseman? If that's all you hunt, you better be unbelievable at that. Because if that's all you do, I don't know if I can coach you to be more competitive. That, doesn't, that only happens in the movies where the coach has the unbelievable speech and people are screaming out of the locker room and they're running out, oh, we're going to kill for you, coach. No, that's, a, that's movies. You have to recruit that attitude and that personality. And it's not always a guy who blows up somebody or you know ruthlessly checks somebody. Some people are quiet assassins that they do their work almost in the shadows, subtly, but if you're a coach, you see it. And so I watch a lot, like people will send me clips. Hey, watch this clip that starts at the five-minute mark. I always go back to 430 because I want to see, I like the preview. What happened before that led to that five-minute right, play? Right. Did he get that tough ground ball at five minutes because he did a great job here and then came into the pile late because he was doing his primary job first? And so I like, I like going to the prequel. I like going to the before the play happen because I think that tells you a lot about a guy's character. So like, I don't think there's anything more important. So if you're listening at home, developing your, your competitive juice and, and level is so important. I think it's harder in this generation because everything has been so structured. I grew up playing basketball on a driveway in, in Levittown that you had no choice. If you wanted to get to the rim, you had to be elbows first and you might have to take, you know, a couple of your teeth and someone else's teeth out is that that means if you want to get to the rim, you're not throwing a hook shot. That means you're going to the rim and probably getting thrown into the garage door. And so I don't know if you can find people like that, but I always ask about, hey, do you have older brothers? Were you beat up a lot? You know, yeah. you know all of these things, all these, they're, they're, they're insightful. But compete level around keeping score in your mind, that's the most important thing for me. Because I can teach someone how to shoot and how to cover somebody, but you can't coach compete level. Yeah, you know, we had a, uh, another coach on who mentioned that, and I agree that uh, a lot of times your best players are not your highly recruited players because they're, they've got an edge and they've got that com compete level. You're, you're one of those guys. Um, and you played with, with uh, 
you know, a lot of anger. One of the most competitive guys I've, I've ever been around. Actually, one of your your friends, uh, I got a quote from it, uh, talking about you. It does not matter if Jerry's coaching lacrosse, uh, playing bocce, or beach games. He is the ultimate competitor and will do anything to win. Who wouldn't want to be around a guy like Jerry? Well, hopefully do everything right to win. Um yeah. You know, I, I just think I think there's I think there's beauty in this. I sent a message to my team, my returning team, and our incoming class, and I was listening to J. Cole, who's a rapper. I know I'm a 57 year old guy who listens yeah. to rap, but you know, J. Cole has this line, and he's also a basketball player. Um, J. Cole's there's beauty in the struggle. Is like I think that that in in your aspiration to become, you know, whether it's a good person, good student. You know, good teammate, great player, is that it's not linear. It's not straightforward. You're going to fail a lot. It's why athletes, college athletes in particular, regardless of division, are the CEOs. They're the best salesmen in organizations. They're the leaders in their communities because they failed and gotten up the next day. Absolutely. And so, you know, I think the, you know, creating a culture and recruiting that mentality is super important. And has nothing. You know, this is not unsportsmanlike. This is there's a there's a level of sportsmanship that sportsmanship has been kind of taken over by almost like political correctness. Is that while you compete, that there's there's you shouldn't be apologetic about how hard you compete after the the game. You shake the hand if you lose. You celebrate if you win. You you struggle if you lose, and you figure out what those lessons are. And that you shake your opponent's hand and hey, congratulations, you were better today. And that and there's and and during that struggle, that you're going to have some successes, some beauty, and some ugliness, unfortunately. And so we're looking for guys who can be totally competitors on the field and be gentlemen, you know, on the streets of Harvard Square and Harvard Yard. That dichotomy is hard to find, you know, to to leave some of that toughness you know, on the field, you're going to need that toughness when you're at Harvard or any great school because it's going to be challenging. So you need that same toughness, that same resiliency. And I think that is really important. But you also touched on the recruiting rankings and all that stuff. You're exactly right. Some of the, the great players that I coached at Notre Dame were guys who were on, you know, Matt Landis never made an Under Armour game. Sergio Perkovic never made an Under Armour game, you know. Like th these are guys who are seminal players, and sometimes they use that frustration to fuel them. And but that's that burns really hot. You gotta, as much as you hate maybe being looked over or unranked, you have to love the process of getting better. You have to love that more than you hate that. Like people, oh, I love, I you know, I hate losing more than I love winning. No, there's nothing, you know, that fuels you like like winning. But you can't have hate fuel. You gotta love your teammates. You gotta love getting up in the morning and doing the work. You gotta love the struggle because that's not gonna be straightforward and not gonna be vertical. There's gonna be there's gonna be struggle in there and you have to have the resiliency to, to go forward. So you gotta love the process more than you hate losing. Yeah, you gotta love the game. You gotta be passionate about the game. And I mean you went through it, I went through it, but preparing yourself as a player to go play at Harvard or to play in the Ivy League, you really can't prepare yourself mentally, maybe, maybe physically, but it's a whole new world. You know, you, you're you're going into uh, a, an environment that's the, probably the most competitive league in the country. Not only you, it's competitive at Harvard, but when you're up playing up against Yale and the Dartmouths and the Cornells, it's it's a, another level. No so, doubt. And, and that, you know, I think parents need to understand that, that, you know, like every, and this, then high school kids or young kids who might be listening to this is that, you know, like every time you've, you've ascended to like, you get to eighth grade and you're like, you're the star of the eighth grade team. And then next thing you know, you're a freshman in high school and you're down at the bottom of the food chain again, and you have to claw your way onto the field, into playing time, into a leadership position. Then you get to senior year, and you're like, prom, I'm graduating from high school, I'm, I'm the big star on my team, and then boom, you're down at the bottom of the rung again. You're an 18-year-old on a team that has you know, 10 or 12 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds on a team, and, so, and, so, and some teams in the country have 28-year-olds. And so you know, grown-ass 
people who are on this team. That that's hard to continually get kicked in the stomach, you know, multiple times in your development. But the guys who have the grit and the com- competitiveness and and a, and a confidence and humility, which are two different, you know, character traits, you know, battling against each other. You have to have humility of like, all right. I'm going to have some success, but I'm also 18 and I have confidence, but I know I have a lot to learn. Like those two things, battling against each other is super healthy. The guy who comes in who thinks he's the man, he he's, he's probably never going to recover from that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but the guy who comes in who's got an attitude of, I know who I am. I know what I have to work on. I'm willing to learn, but I also think I can do these things now as an 18 year old against 21 year olds. A guy who has that kind of humility and self-awareness is typically very successful on the field eventually and also makes good decisions on Friday and Saturday nights. He knows why he's here. He knows what the value of of being at Harvard is, and he doesn't want to jeopardize that. Um, But I think parents, you know, they they want their kids to be the star all the time. And and one of the things I realized um, having my kids play college sports is that they're not always going to be the star. You're lucky if they be the guy who has the ball at the end of the game or, you know, makes the great save or the great goal. And that if you hunt that, oh my god, it'll be the most stressful thing watching your kids compete. If you're like, "Holy mackerel, my kid is a college athlete on some level, doesn't, you know, NAIA, MCLA, Division 3, Division 2, II, Division 1, whatever it is." The joy of watching your kids progress as people, and I know this sounds like a rationalization, but I learned that, and I'm a guy who does this for a living. I, I learned that watching my kids go through it. My son played in nearly every game of his college career at Notre Dame. He was never a star, but he was the guy behind the guy. He was the guy behind Brian Costabile and, and Sergio Perkovic. He was the guy and, making all those little plays. He was that hockey assist. He was yeah, the hockey yeah, assist yeah, exactly. guy. And my daughter you know, tore her ACL and never – you know, actualized her thing. But my daughter's also in med school now. My like, I don't like. There's like, be happy that your kid or uh, kids are on this process. And the fact that my daughter tore ACL and was an athlete allowed her to pivot and allowed her to get through that probably better than anybody else would if it was a non-athlete. And she picked the right school. She was had an unbelievable yeah. academic school gave him the opportunity to go to med school and she's off and running and and to your point after college you're starting right all over again exactly entry-level jobs and you got to work your way up and it takes a long time and we're still working i'm 58 you're 57 it never ends you got to continue to you know roll up your sleeves go out there and and work and and compete and and you know because of social media and because of all the stuff that that is out there you know people are focused on the obvious too much like all right, what you know? Did, how many goals did I score and things like that? Creating a culture at Harvard, which we're trying to do, which is each of you are valued. Each of you are contributing in some way. I just sent this message to our team the other night. It's like we have half of our team are people who've never been at Harvard who are coming next fall, and then half the team is uh, are guys who haven't played since you know March 2020. Like, who knows what's going to happen? But you can all contribute. For some, it's you're a great locker room guy. For some guys, you're a great scout team guy. Some is you're a great model of, of how to balance athletics and academics. For some, your service efforts. For some is whatever it is that you all have value. And, and as a coach in a program, we have to recognize all the abilities and gifts that guys can contribute because that's how you create a powerful and healthy culture. How many players do you bring in every year, freshman class? It, it varies it, it from vary. year. It'll vary. Like, it'll vary anywhere from 9 to 11 would be my guess. And yeah. that, that depends on, on your needs? Uh, it depends on what Harvard supports us with. You know, th- these are strange times sure. because of the pandemic and people taking deferrals and leaves of absence. Harvard doesn't want to have 60 people on the roster like I don't want to have 60 people on the roster like a lot of teams now with 50 years and grad students and and transfers and you know for the next three years the best seniors on every top team are all going to be staying you know plus the transfers and things like that so I think it's a great opportunity for our league because you can't be a grad student and you can't it's really hard to transfer into an Ivy League school and so um, that we're not going to have that problem our challenge will be these leaves of absences and deferrals, and that'll be our challenge. Our teams are going to get a little bit bigger than historically, but they're not going to be in the 
55, 60 range. Might be a little more challenging playing outside your conference next year, but playing inside your conference, you're all sort of playing yes. by the same rules. What's going to be interesting, I wanted to ask you this question is, technically, you're almost going to have three freshman classes next year because um, your freshman class two years ago played five games. Your first year, you beat your alma mater. That must have been a great, great uh, uh, thrill for you. But so you're going to be managing, you know, two freshman classes and a, technically a, a junior class that only played five games. So you can really call them all freshmen, right. very young. So that's going to be a, a whole new experience for, for all the coaches in the Ivy League. There, there is no Harvard case study to address that, I can yeah. tell you that much. And so you, you look for, you look for, you know, lessons out. Like I said, I, you know, I, I lean on a Harvard Business School a lot for management solutions and, and things like that. And then you go with your gut. Like, but you're exactly right. Having all these young guys, and and I've probably only been on the field with my the half my team that's coming back is maybe 30 or 40 times, and so there's still a little mystery around that as we try to turn around the program. And then we got all these young guys that we recruited that are coming in. It's 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 hard to predict. But one of the things that I do all the time is 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 in in sometimes in funny ways. It might be a movie clip. And otherwise, it might be an article that you find, might be in a quote, is reminding them what we value, what we're about, kind of what it means to represent Harvard, and it'll help drive the really good decisions. Almost like parenting. It would be nice if parenting, you only had to say something once and they followed your instruction, but you kind of have to kind of reiterate what we're about with our guys. And I think if you have that foundation, the talent and the coaching that we, the talent that we have and the coaching that we'll deliver will will set us on the path from where we are in the Ivy League to the Ivy League championship. And I know your message to the committed players and you know you bring in a number of players who have all these accolades in high school. When you're committed, it's the fi it's not the finish line, it's the starting line, and all the accolades don't mean anything. No. It's a whole new ball game. The, the rankings don't matter. I, I Whenever our guys get invited to some of these games, Under Armour games or Nike National All-Star game, I always send them a text and say, hey, congratulations. And then I wait till they come back. Oh, thanks, coach. Thanks for the support. And then like five minutes after that, I send them another text that says, nobody cares. Your resume isn't taped to your helmet. You know, and some of the best guys, as you alluded to, are guys who weren't ranked by some system because they had that chip and they were like, you know, they had the, they, they're, they hate that they weren't ranked, but they love the journey and the process. So, yeah, nobody cares because when we get onto the field, it's all about performance. Yep. It's all about uh, rolling up the sleeves and getting as many ground balls as you can and be a good teammate. Jerry, it's been great. You've been a f fabulous guest and I really appreciate you coming in today. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun, haven't you? Awesome. Well, great to catch up, and best of luck at Harvard. Looking forward to uh, seeing you out on the sidelines. Go Crimson.